tell the greatest story love has ever told. Broken, you chose to be broken. Your sacrifice has spoken freedom to my soul.
He had shared those same prophetic words with Elisha as well. But I think more than likely the Spirit of God had been preparing Elisha for this very moment in time so that Elijah's departure would not come as a surprise. So in answer to the young men, Elisha says, yes, I know, but please, let's not talk about it. An understanding that it was God's will and his plan to take his dear friend and mentor from him, Elisha grieved in, in his heart at the thought of losing those face-to-face, man-to-man encounters, heart-to-heart -heart with a man of God. You may have someone in your life that has been your spiritual mentor, that uh, you just stood in awe of their relationship with the Heavenly Father. And you love to spend time just, just kind of digging into their heart to find out what it is that connected them so closely to the Father. Well, again, Elijah encourages Elisha to stay behind in Bethel while he obeys the Lord's command to go on to Jericho. And I'm not sure why Elijah had such a busy itinerary on his last day before being taken up in a whirlwind, but maybe he has something to do with there being another school of prophets in Jericho as well. That they need to hear a word from the Lord before Elijah is taken up into the heavens. And so he goes on to Jericho uh, to meet up with, with these folks at the seminary there. More than likely, Elijah delivers the same final message to them as he did at the school in Bethel. Informing that the Lord was going to take him that very day before it was over. And thinking that they are now privy to some inside information that no one else knows about, as did the students at Bethel, they inquire of Elisha that he is aware that his master is going to be taken from him that very day. Yes, I know, he said. Can we just not talk about it? Elijah has one final appointment to keep on that God directed, uh, before his God-directed whirlwind tour, he, his last stop would be at the Jordan River. And he knows that if he's going to get over to that final resting place, he must first cross over the Jordan. There's been many a gospel song that's been written about what lies just beyond the Jordan River. On Jordan's stormy banks, I stand and cast a wishful eye. Oh, who will come and go with me? I am bound for the promised land. I'm bound for the promised land. I'm bound for the promised land. Oh, who will come and go with me? I'm bound for the promised land. Shall we gather at the river, the beautiful, beautiful river? Gather with the saints at the river. They come by the sight of the throne of God. I won't have to cross Jordan alone. Those just to name a few. For the Christian believer, the Jordan River, and it comes to symbolize that passage from this life to eternal life. Joshua and the Israelites had to cross over the Jordan River in order to get into the promised land. Captain Naaman had to go dip himself seven times in the Jordan River to be cleansed of leprosy. John baptized Jesus in the Jordan River. And it's only Jesus that can guide us safely across to the other side when our time comes to enter into heaven's shore. Elisha was determined to stick with Elijah until that very time came when the Lord would snatch him from this earth. And so he insisted on going down to the Jordan River with him. And now the water was deep and the current was treacherous. There was no boat. There was no... Um, there's no access to the other shore. And the only thing that uh, they had to rely on was the power of God to get them to the other side. And brothers and sisters, when we have the power of God, it doesn't matter what the obstacle is. He is more than enough. Amen? God's Spirit infused that mantle, that cloak that Elijah wore over his shoulders. And Elijah took that off and doubled it in half and he smote the waters with it. And God used that to part the waters of the Jordan River once again. Just as he'd done in the days when the priests 
when it stood with the Ark of the Covenant out in the Jordan River, when it was at flood stage, they were able to walk across on dry ground. But when they got to the other side, Elijah makes it very clear that now is the time. His time has come to depart from this whole world. He says to Elijah, but Elisha, his mentee, now what can I do for you before I go? How do you answer that question? There's a million things that I could think of about what I might ask of Elijah if he were to ask me that question. What can I do for you before I go? Well, let's see. Before we look at how Elisha responds, let's look at ways he does not respond. He doesn't say, well, I don't know. Let me think about it for a while and I'll get back to you. He doesn't have time for that. He didn't name all the people that he knew that were sick and injured or dying and asked for healing. He didn't name off a list of physical resources that he would need for the journey ahead, for his ministry that he would undertake as, his, as uh, Elijah's predecessor, or successor, I should say. He didn't ask for a, a big church with a lot of people that would come and follow him. So what did he ask for? Without having to think twice about it. He says, Elijah, I want what you have. I see in you something that I lack. Only I'm not satisfied to have just what you have. I want twice that much. I want a, a double portion. What I need is the power of God in my life to carry out the mission that he has for me. It wasn't that Elisha needed twice as much as God. He just knew that without God's power, he was basically helpless. He would need this extraordinary moving of God's spirit in his life in order for it to be possible to carry out the task that God had for him. What is it that keeps us from experiencing a mighty movement of God's Spirit? I don't think we can say it's because God hasn't made Himself available to us. The more likely reason is we've not made ourselves available to Him to be used in such a way. We have an opportunity every time we come to worship to express directly to that power source what we need. That uh, you know, what, we, what we tend to do uh, oftentimes, and not to be critical, but oftentimes we come with a grocery list of wants and needs that we bring before him before we ever consider what God would have on his heart and mind. Elisha said, Lord, Please give me what you gave to Elijah. Only make mine a double. I don't think you can have a more dramatic departure from earth than being swept up in a chariot of fire in a whirlwind. Must have been an awesome sight to behold. I've never done a funeral like that. And even though Elisha stood there in the midst of it all, he still lived to tell about it. Not only that, but he, he took up Elijah's mantle that had fallen on his way up into the heavens. And that double portion of God's spirit rested upon him. He took that garment, once again, just as Elijah had done. And he struck the waters of the Jordan River and he walked back across to the west side. I'm dry ground. Now there were, he wasn't alone. In the observation of what took place that day, there were some other eyewitness, eyewitnesses that, uh, to all that happened that day. You see a large group of seminary students. I'm using a uh, little uh, freedom this morning. But these were from the School of Prophets there at Jericho. They had come out to sit on the banks, on the west bank of the Jordan River, and could see across the river to what all had taken place as they saw Elijah being taken up by the chariots of fire and the whirlwind. And they somehow assumed that he got deposited somewhere else. And so they offered to send out a, a cohort to go looking for Elijah, see if they could bring him back. 
Elisha tried to tell them, but they wouldn't listen. We flash forward a little bit now. And God has performed a miracle through Elisha, the first that we have on record. In Jericho, it seemed like they had a water problem. I guess we need him up in Flint, Michigan, right? We need Elisha in Flint. So there was a there was something wrong with the water. And so Elijah, Elisha went to Jericho and uh, sought the Lord and, and cleared up the problem with their drinking water. It was causing women to miscarry and all sorts of health problems. And he's now uh, under the direction of the Holy Spirit. He's headed now toward Bethel. To proclaim the word of the Lord to the city there that had lost its identity. We know a little bit about Bethel, don't we? Bethel's that place where Jacob wrestled with the angel. Where that place was later given this name. Which means the house of God. Or place of God. It's at that place where Jacob had encountered the living God. That he built this altar to worship the Lord. And he called it Bethel. And what should have been a place dedicated to the worship of Yahweh, the God of Israel, had now become defiled. Become an idolatrous city. And even though there was a school of the prophets there in Bethel, it was anything but a center of worship. Hosea who ministered after Elijah, actually called this city beth Haven, which means house of wickedness. To have his name changed from house of God now to house of wickedness. The name of shame given to it when Jeroboam was the king of the northern uh, nation of Israel. Out of his greed and out of his fear that people would... Uh, make the uh, annual journey down to Jerusalem and perhaps decide to stay in, Ju in, in Judah. Uh, he designated two cities in, in the northern kingdom of Israel's places to worship. And there he set up golden calves for the people to come and bow down to and worship other than to worship the one true God of Israel. Set up in Bethel of all places. A place dedicated to God and other in Dan. And in these temples, this golden calf, remember what, how God felt about the golden calf in the, as the Israelites wandered in the wilderness, but I guess our memory gets a little short. And in complete disobedience to God's law, Jeroboam established this in the presence of Israel. Beth means house of, and El means God. Aben, on the other hand, uh, the Jew is a derivative from the Hebrew awen, which means trouble or sorrow or idolatry, wickedness and emptiness. Not only does it, the word portray an iniquity that causes sorrow, calamity and failure, but it also portrays an emptiness which naturally moves toward idolatry as its means to fill the emptiness. We know that when our hearts are empty, we seek to fill it with something. God created us with a need to seek after something that's superior to us. Something that we worship. And men and women seek all sorts of things to fill up that emptiness other than turning to God the Creator. You see, when people are empty of God and His Word, they'll naturally fill their lives with physical or philosophical things that only lead to idolatry, which then leads to iniquity, which then leads to calamity, and it leaves you feeling even more empty than when you first started. Bethel's in desperate need of the Word of God to expose their sin and, and hopefully bring them back to God as they, their hearts were convicted uh, by uh, the Holy Spirit this was the only hope that they had because the old devil was now determined to keep his clutches in place and, and to prevent the city of Bethel from turning back to God. There was possibly a few there that responded to Elisha's message, but Satan was so entrenched now in, in Bethel that 
The city as a whole never really turned to the Lord, nor did they respond to the word, except to rebel and to get belligerent toward God's prophet. We observe that in many of our institutions today of higher learning, that once started out as a place to educate young men and women, young men uh, as ministers, and teachers of the word, and then later women, started out as places dedicated to the Lord. Then through liberal thought and, and idolatry, allowed Satan to creep in. So many of the universities that started out as Christian are now some of the most godless places on the planet. And this story is kind of like one of the hard facts that we need to understand as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we're being obedient to be his witnesses like we're called to be, to proclaim the truth of the gospel, <gasps> Not everyone is going to be willing to receive it, not joyful to receive it. And sometimes we just have to do as Elisha and Paul and some of the other, all of the other apostles did as us learn to shake the dust off of our shoes and move on to the next opportunity. It says, and as he was walking, that calls our attention to the time and the place of Satan's attack. It simply occurred as he was walking down the road to his next appointment, on his, on his way, minding his own business. He wasn't even preaching at this point in time. You know, we never know when Satan, when or where Satan's going to launch his next attack. And it's usually when we're not expecting it that he creeps in on us, sneaks up on us, because he's creeping about and roaring like a lion, seeking whom he may devour. We we'll never know where he's going to set up his next ambush. And just when we think things are settling down to normalcy, once again, he strikes harder than ever. It might be when you're in the kitchen fixing dinner and the phone rings. It might be while you're driving down the road. Somebody cuts you off. It might be at the church, while you're passing in the hall. Even. Certainly Satan wouldn't try to creep in here, would he? Might even be at the deacon's meeting, God forbid. A lot of people learn to stay away from business meetings because sometimes Satan has a way of creeping in there as well. And this is why we must always, in spite of how calm things appear to be, we need to take heed lest we fall, it says in 1 Corinthians 10, 12. We must watch ourselves so that we too don't become tempted and fall into that same sin. We need to be careful about how we're walking, Paul says in Ephesians 5, 15. Because we live in an evil world where evil lurks around every corner. And Satan's on the prowl, seeking someone to devour. And he's waging war against God's people. Now, the NIV, which I'm using this morning, says that he was, as he's walking along the road, that some boys came out of the town. The King James, if you're following the King James this morning, says little children came out to taunt him. The Holman says that small boys came out. The New American Standard says that uh, some young lads came out. And the Living Bible calls them a gang of young men. So which one is right? <laughs> We've got all kinds of translations about these. We know that they're male, at least, right? We don't know what age, uh, but uh, let me share this information with you. That the Hebrew word here is naar. It's N-A-A-R. And it was used to describe servants in the Old Testament as well. And then also of soldiers. So we know that soldiers won't be little children or little boys. And it's also used of, to describe Isaac when he was 28 years old. So uh, uh, we know that they can be anywhere from young lads to 
Young men. I tend to believe that these were young men. Perhaps, even though it doesn't say here, I, I really believe that these young men came from the seminary. Came from that school of the prophets who were, thought they were so smart in theological things. Who thought that they were above any man, man that came preaching the word of God that didn't have any more education than they did. Oftentimes pride wells up in the hearts of, of, of men who are educated and think that they have all the answers. And so these students, young men as they were, having been sent, I believe, by their teachers. This idolatrous priest who served in the temple there at Bethel that uh, Jeroboam had established came out to make a mockery of God's servant, to challenge his authority to act as the mouthpiece of God. And even though Elisha had traveled to Bethel to bless them, he had come to bring God's blessing and bring healing, to bring restoration, to bring them back to God, yet they would became so obstinate, so cold-hearted, that they came out before he ever arrived into the city and cursed him and made fun of him. They detested his message that he delivered. So they jeered at him, get out of here, Baldy. Get out of here, Baldy. Wasn't enough to call him Baldy one time. He had to do it twice. You might think that's funny. Well, I can identify with Elisha here. I suppose that I've been called a name or two. Called him bald and fat. In other words, it doesn't matter who you are. Leaders have always had to deal with disrespect. Let me just say a word on that. And you might not like Barack Obama, our president, President Obama. That doesn't give us the right make a mockery of his name. I don't know how many times I, oftentimes I look at people's comments after news articles. I am just ashamed of the nation that we live in. They call each other names and degrade and just, just below the dignity of human beings to act that way toward each other, let alone those that God has put in authority over us. Let's get off track a little bit. We also see disrespect shown to God's appointed leaders throughout the Old and the New Testament. But the, the greatest disrespect here is in relationship to God. It's not so much that they're making a mockery of Elisha. What they're doing is making a mockery of God himself. These young men set about to do the bidding of the master of evil and deceit himself. They're at the beck and call of Satan. They're not just attacking Elisha the man. They're waging war against the God who is the creator. It wasn't just about Elisha's physical appearance or his personality or even his shortcomings. It was an attack against God, against God's man Bearing God's message. And ultimately what they were doing was making a mockery of and disrespecting, rejecting God, trashing his message that he was sending through Elisha. Now the words of these two boys were offensive in at least two ways. First, they weren't just saying, get out of here. They were saying, go up. Go up, Baldy. That is, why don't you just do, go ahead and do what you claim your buddy Elijah did? You say that he went up in the world. Why don't you just follow in his footsteps and get on up out of here as well so we don't have to deal with it? God had just done a miracle by taking up Elijah in that world and having chariots of fire. And that should have added credence to the hope that we have in Christ that we too can look forward to one day being caught up to meet him in the air. That there's going to be a resurrection one day. 
where God is going to fulfill the promise to come back and receive us to his own. By making the mockery of God's prophet Elisha, they were denying. the dead, denying his actions in history. The second way it was offensive is that they mocked his hairstyle, or lack thereof. Bible scholars have explained to us that baldness in those days was regarded as a kind of disgrace or a curse. It was actually associated with the consequences of leprosy. We know how they felt about lepers. This wasn't just boys being boys here. This was a satanic attack to maliciously degrade and malign the man of God as if to say, you are nothing but a purger. You deserve no respect. And now we are not, never going to listen to you or to, or to have anything to do with you ever again. And we're going to put an end to this and we're going to prevent you from going any further spreading your malarkey, your propaganda. I believe this is typical of the schemes and the methods by which Satan seeks to nullify the ministry of God's people, his saints, and the work of God. He attacks both the message, the word, and the messenger, the one who was sent to bring it. He seeks to discourage or to discredit the teacher. Or he attacks those are, that are hearing the message. Whatever he can do to get people's eyes off the Lord Jesus Christ, to get their eyes off the Heavenly Father and their ears closed to his word, that's what he's going to do. He's going to try to stop the word from going forth. He's going to use any circumstance that he can. He's going to usually comes out over petty issues. Things that don't really amount to a hill of beans. Whatever he can do to get our eyes off the Lord might be through misunderstandings, miscommunication. Might be that somebody's personality clashes with ours. Might be physical appearance. Might be a deviant way to bring about some distraction or a roadblock that causes us to stumble. As the Word of God says, we all need to be very careful that we don't get caught up in reacting to those kinds of things, lest we too become Satan's instrument to bring discouragement to the heart of God's saints. Because Satan's launching an all-out attack on our brothers and sisters at any time. Especially against those who are appointed to watch over your souls and to care for you. When we see Elisha's reaction to this and then we see God's action, it ought to emphasize to us the seriousness of maligning and trying to discourage any of God's servants. Before we focus on what Elisha did, let's be aware of what he did not do. He didn't turn and run. He acted with courage and strength. He stood his ground. He did not argue with them or return insult for insult. He did not compromise the message that God had given to him. He did not act or react out of his own ego or sense of pride or out of anxiety or trying to act out of self-defense. He did not complain to the Lord and threaten to quit his job because the Rugon was getting tough. He simply ignored those harsh, angry words, those actions and those attitudes that came against him. We can all stand and take a lesson from Elisha and how to respond to Satan's attacks when they come, especially when they come at the hands of other people especially when they come in the hands of other sheep. Verse 24 says, He turned around, He looked at them and called down a curse on them in the name of the Lord. Well, this is not cursing in the manner in which we think of cursing. He did not issue 
vile words of profanity or to swear at them as we would think of in today's terminology. But the Hebrew word here is bilal, which means be swift and slight, trifling, or of little account. And what it indicates here is a lowering from a place of blessing. It simply called for God to revoke his blessing upon these young men. I can't think of anything worse than to be outside of God's blessing. How often, we seldom think about it, but each and every day, we are blessed of God. And if it weren't for God's blessing, we'd be in a heap of trouble. How often does he protect you going down the road? When we don't even know about it, things that could happen, that would happen without his blessing being there. Different things throughout our life. The emphasis here is on the absence, the reversal or the removal of that blessing, that blessed state that God provides for our protection, his provision and blessing. And the principle is very simple. Without God's blessing, we all stand cursed. The moment that God removed that wall of protection from Job, remember? Satan was allowed to come and wreck havoc in his life. So in response to the hardness of these young men's hearts and their unresponsiveness to the correction of God's spirit and by the authority that God had given to Elisha, Elisha simply turned them over to bear the consequences of their sin. This ought to demonstrate to the city of Bethel and to everyone that heard, who heard about it, so I'm sure the news travel fast. It may not have the internet in those days or, or smartphones and that sort of thing. And people get on Twitter and, and, and whatnot, what but the word traveled fast about what happened that day. But I'll bear a warning about the way we treat God's servants and the bearer, the bearer of the message of God. What happened that day was a gruesome sight. It wasn't Elisha that called out the bears. He just called for God to remove his blessing. God is the one who sent those two bears, two mother bears. They came out of the woods and they mauled 42 of the young men. They killed them that day. What a harrowing story. Just think of the headlines and the news reports. Think it would strike the fear of God into everyone around. For years to come. The curse of sin is death. But unfortunately, we have short memories. The heart of man is such that we either ignore it, reject it, or we soon forget. The word to us this morning that God does not take lightly when his word is ignored, when it's hindered in its propagation by his appointed messengers. This is a serious business, taking the word of God to the world. As believers, we need to learn to expect opposition. The more we move out to do God's bidding, to carry out his mission, the more attacks that we can expect to face from our adversary. Remember, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. There are evil forces in place that use people like you and me. If we aren't watching ourselves, if we don't get caught up in it. Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they'll also persecute you, in John 15, 20. And as Paul stated in 2 Timothy 3.12, it's a fact. Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. If you're doing what God tells you to do, you expect that people aren't going to always respond favorably to what you're doing. Verse 25 says he went on to Mount Carmel. And from there, we turned to Samaria. What was he doing while he went? He continued to do what God told him. Be his messenger, to speak boldly to all who would listen, to give the word of God so that they could be 
renewed and restored back to a relationship with the Heavenly Father. Wonder who will be the next to take up the mantle of Elisha and act courageously when mere men and women would faint or run. Will you be that man? Will you be that woman? That boy or girl? That teenager? People in this corrupt world that heed not the words of Christ still need the good news more than ever. So the question is, who will still go? Who will go and be the messenger? Would you stand with me? The worship team is going to come and lead us in a song of invitation. You might just stand quietly and ponder the words more than anything to let the Holy Spirit speak to your heart. And to respond to me, I'm going to ask that the doors in the back be closed for this time. This is a sacred time, the time of the invitation. It's time for us to really let the Spirit of God search our hearts. More important than getting on to the next event is letting God do his work in your heart. God's speaking to you, to you this morning. Let me implore you to respond in obedience. This altar is available for you to come and heal humbly and pray. There's something you need to confess, something you need to turn to, to repent of. There's a brother or sister that you need to go to and Restore some broken relationships. Maybe some harsh words were said. Maybe they, you realize now that you may have been a vehicle for Satan to launch an attack on someone that you love. You just want to ask for forgiveness. Don't be afraid. Step out. Be courageous to do what God wants you to do. I'll be here at the front to receive you. I'll pray with you. And God's call you to unite with this church to be a part of this body to serve him. I'm going to invite you to come as well. Just renew your commitment to him this morning. Prayerfully respond as the team sings the song of invitation.
Put each other's needs ahead of our own. We ask this in Jesus' name. 